All right. Hey, good morning, Three Circle Church. All of our campuses joining us are right now in Thomasville, there in Midtown, Mobile, Daphne, and online, man. Happy Father's Day to everyone. It's going to be a great day. And let me just encourage you dads and you granddads and you, uh, you foster dads, you stepdads, all of you in this room. Uh, if you're a man and you are leading kids in some way or have led kids in some way, man, we just want to honor you. We want to thank you for what you do. You know, I've always said it seems like on Mother's Day, we talk about how awesome moms are at church. And then on Father's Day, we just beat the dads up. You know what I mean? And so, so we're like, no, no, no. We want to inspire and challenge you guys at the same time. But here's what I know uh, in our, at, at our church. Here's what I see. I see a whole bunch of dads that love their kids and love their families and are trying to get it right to the honor and glory of God, and I want to honor you guys today, and thank you for that. I love it. Appreciate it. At all of our campuses, Midtown Mobile, I see you dads, man. I know how you want to lead your families well. In Thomasville, I know you guys, man. You want to get it right. In Daphne, you want to. That is your heart. And so today, I hope that in Journeys Part 2, because we're in the middle of this incredible journey series, and we're looking at God-designed journeys that teach God-designed lessons. And if we want to know how to be a dad, we look to the Word of God for all things in life including fatherhood, we go there. But if you're here today and you think, oh, great, like I, I'm, if you're not a dad or, or you're a lady in the room and you go, okay, I could just check out, this isn't going to be for me. No, 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 this is going to be for all of us because we're going to look at another one of those journeys. And if you're new with us, what we're doing is we're going Genesis to Revelation and we're looking at trips that people took in the Bible, like a lot of you are taking trips. We just took a trip this past week to a baseball tournament, okay? So I bet you have either a trip that you have taken already this summer, you got one planned, maybe it's a small, short trip, maybe it's a long trip. Last week, we looked at Noah's trip that he took. Noah on the ark for 370 days. That's a, I've never taken a trip that long, you know what I mean? But we're going to look at a three-day trip today. It's like one of those long weekends. How many of you love it when it's like you got Monday, it's Memorial Day or something like Labor Day? You get a three-day weekend, right? We're going to look at one of those today that's going to teach us a huge lesson. It's going to teach us about fatherhood. It's going to teach us just about following God and how to worship God. It's going to teach us about, like all these journeys will, about how God deals with us. Because remember, the entire Word of God is there primarily. It does lots of things, but primary purpose of all of the Word of God is to reveal God to us because we could never find God on our own. We're not capable of that. So God lovingly reveals himself to us in two primary ways, and that is the Word of God and the person of Christ. And so today we're going to see that this journey that we're going to look at, this three-day long weekend, so to speak, is going to teach us about God. Today we're going to look at Abraham. And his son Isaac. They took a trip together, three days. Now, Abraham is one of the most important figures in the entire Bible. This is an actual picture that was taken of Abraham. I'm just kidding, but somebody thought, man, eh, it's probably how he looked. So, Abraham was an important guy. In fact, there's only a few covenants in the Bible, and one of them was last week, Noah, that God made the Noahic covenant, which means he made an agreement with them. And he did one with Abraham, it's known as the Abrahamic covenant. And he said, Abraham, through you, I'm going to make a great nation. And through you, I'm going to bless all the nations. And that meant Jesus was going to come from Abraham and his family, right? The problem is Abraham got old and didn't have a baby yet. But he kept believing that God would be faithful. And guess what? God gave them a miracle baby. You know the Bible is full of God giving people miracle babies. And, uh, and, and so Abraham just kept praying. And you know what? God gave him and his old wife, Sarah, all right, gave them a baby, and that baby was Isaac. Again, that is exactly how Isaac looked. There were some eyewitnesses. The joke's getting old now, I understand. So anyway, that is Isaac. And so Sarah and Abraham, famously in old age, have this baby. And, and Abraham loved God. Abraham was a worshiper of God. Abraham, we, you know, I grew up in church calling him Father Abraham, and we sang that song, Father Abraham had many sons. Y'all remember that? And many sons had? Father yeah, Father Abraham. But you think, known as Father Abraham, he spent most of his life without a kid. It was later on. And that kid grew. And, and you know, let me just say this. When, when you, and Abraham was kind of like a grandparent. And let me just say this, when I went to my grandparents' house, I knew it was party time because I hung the moon, you know. 
But at mom and dad's house, you might get fussed at a little more. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Go to granddad, they're like, oh, baby, it's okay. You know, uh, eat whatever you want. Back home, it was like, hey, get in the yard. We got work to do. Okay, a little bit of that going on. Well, a little bit of that was going on with Isaac and Abraham. Think about it. Isaac's his miracle baby, and so as he grew up, man, he could do no wrong probably. And They just loved him so much. And then when he was 15 years old, 15, because a lot of people, when they hear the story I'm about to tell you, they think he was a little bitty boy. He was 15 years old. He's a teenager. I have a 15-year-old in my house. So he's basically a, a little man at this point, a young man. This story took place. Abraham has a God-designed trip demanded of him, a hike, if you will, to some mountains, three-day trip. And on this trip, God is going to change Abraham and Isaac's life. Let's dive in. Genesis 22, 21. It says this. Now it came to pass after these things that God, what's that word, everybody? He tested Abraham. After these things, what? After lots of things. After God was faithful and gave him a child. And after God worked the miracle and all these things, he tested Abraham. And he said to him, Abraham, and Abraham said as he always did. Abraham's cards were always on the table with God. Here, here I am. Here I am, whatever you need, whatever you want, whatever your command is. Now let's dive in right out of the gate into the first line. You need to know this, God will test you. Every single one of us in this room, man, woman, father, mother, all of us, God will test you, but he will never tempt you. And the difference in those two words is absolutely crucial. God does not dangle a carrot in front of his children to see how fast you will run. He is not tempting you. But he will test us like any great teacher. How many of you remember being in school? I took Scantron tests back in the day, the multiple choice. How many of you were of my generation, you remember those, right? You just go through and and remember, I always thought if I forgot about a test or whatever, I would just pick one of the rows and go all the way down thinking percentage-wise, I got a chance, right? I got a chance here. And some anyway, kids don't do as I say, you know, or or did or whatever. You know, don't don't follow that example. Most of the time I was prepared. So you remember that you would take a test. Notice God's a good teacher because some teachers like to give you a test on something they didn't teach you. Now that's not fair. God doesn't do that. God will never test you on something he hadn't taught you. You can look all the way through the Bible. He always tests, what does that scripture say? After these things. He will teach and then he will test. And he will teach and he will test. You can go to the children of Israel when God brought them out of Egypt in the Exodus. And what does he do? He works a a water miracle, the most famous water miracle of all, splits the Red Sea. What does he do after he shows them and teaches them that he can work water miracles? He puts them in the desert with no water and he gives them a test. And if you remember the story, they failed the test all day long because they got mad and looked at Moses and said, no, we're out here in the desert. We're gonna, there's no water. We're going to die. And you can just imagine teacher God, Father God going, didn't I just tell you, didn't I just show you that I can do uh, water miracles? They had to learn to trust him. Well, the same thing happens here. God has taught Abraham that he can do anything and that he keeps his promises. And that even when you think it looks like he's not going to keep his promise, he still does. So he tests, but he will not tempt us. So this means when you are tempted, you can automatically know it's not God. James 1.13 says this, Let no one say, when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. That's important because the reason God does not tempt you is because it would be a violation of his character and God never violates his character ever. That means your God has perfect, seamless integrity. How many of you wish that you had perfect, seamless integrity? Don't you wish that? Because haven't we all in this room done things that did not line up with who we were or who we said we were or what we say we believe. How many of you know that we've all done that, right? God has never violated his character. He's never violated who he is. Now, what's the difference in temptation and testing? Temptation is always meant for your destruction. It comes from the evil one or it comes from your own flesh, your own sin nature that we're all born with will pull at us. It means 
for your destruction. But testing, which comes from God, is always meant for our growth. So what is God doing when he tests you? He's trying to grow you. He's not trying to snag you or, or get you in a trap. He's not tempting you. He wants you to grow. And by the way, since he's sovereign, he knows when you're going to fail the test and when you're going to pass it. But even in the failing of your test sometimes, you still grow. So God will test you. How many of you have ever taken one of God's tests? One of his quizzes, right? And it's good to recognize that as his children. To go, wait a minute, I'm being tested here. God is testing me. He's growing me. He's trying to help me grow. And I want you to understand that God wants you to grow. A very important part of your walk with God is to know what he expects. Clarity is a nice thing. Like with my kids being a dad, one thing I understand is that it's never good for me to try to hold my kids accountable for something that I wasn't clear about, right? If I think it and just assume that they get what I want from them and they don't meet my standard and then I get angry with them or upset with them, that's not fair. I wasn't clear about it. Well, the Bible is very clear, something that God wants for us, so we should not be surprised. God wants us to grow. He does not want you stagnant. He wants you growing all of the time. James 1.4 says this, Let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. God desires that in you and every believer. And we can go all the way back to Abraham. The reason Abraham and Isaac's about to take the three-day trip they're about to take is because God knew that Abraham still lacked things. How many of you still lack things in your walk with God? Only four or five. Everybody else has arrived. Man, it's a strong room. It's the 8 o'clock crowd, right? For those of you in Thomasville and uh, Midtown, you know, I'm, I'm sure a lot of hands just went up. You go, I lack things. I do too. And, and you know what? God reveals where my lacking is, and then he grows me into that. He wants to see me lacking nothing. Now, who's the only person who's ever walked this planet? Just say it loud. Say it in Midtown. Say it in Thomasville on this Father's Day. Who's the only person who walked this earth who lacked nothing? Nothing when it came to growth and maturity. Jesus. So that's where God's taken us. That's where he was trying to take Abraham. Abraham didn't even really know Jesus, right? Didn't know who he was yet. He was in the future. But God has always been molding us towards the image of his son. So what happens next? Let's go to verse 2. Genesis 22, 2 says, Then he said, so here it goes. It's a God-designed trip that's going to teach a God-designed lesson. God said, take now your son. Now watch what God does. Take now your son, your only son whom you love. Three descriptions. Take your son. Oh, your only son. Oh, the the son you love. And go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. Oh, my goodness. Wait a minute. And God is clear. It's not like God doesn't know the impact this is going to have. See, you need to understand, you have a very precise God. What is going on here? Well, it's it's pretty obvious, isn't it? The thing Abraham loves the most in his life on earth is what? Isaac. He loves this boy. Every day, this boy's now a 15-year-old kid. His voice is starting to change. You know how kids do about that age. He's probably sassing back at Abraham a little bit if he's a normal 15-year-old. But every day, Abraham goes, that's my miracle. That's God's faithfulness walking around. I know God keeps his promises, and then God does this? What is going on here? Let me me give you something else. Because remember, the Bible is here to, to reveal God to us. You need to know these things about your father. You need to get to know him. And here's another thing we learn. God wants our hearts He doesn't just want you to grow. He wants your heart. And no one knows how to get to your heart better than God. God knows where your heart is. He knows your heart better than you do. He clearly knew it better than Abraham did. Abraham didn't know that this area he lacked in his life was that he maybe loved Isaac too much. Isaac held a place in his heart that was so high, so strong. This is really important for us to understand. Now, I have three kids. I'm a dad. I'm in the boat with all you dads in the room, okay? All of you dads in Midtown and Daphne and Thomasville and online. I'm a dad. And here's what I know about my three kids. Like, 
If I want to get to their heart, even like consequences and discipline, it works different for all three of my kids. It's not the same. I have one kid that if I take his cell phone or take his ability to go hang out with his friends, it's like, dun, 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 dun. You know what I mean? Like it's game changer because that's his heart. And I know that about him. I, I know if I take this, I've got you. That's your button. But I got another kid that, that he, he doesn't care about a phone or any of that. Like his phone that he has will lay on the floor and be dead for days and days. That's not his thing. But if I take his ability to go play basketball or go play baseball or meet up with his buddies to go to the batting cages, if I take the sport away and the ability to go practice his sport and do his thing, there's his heart. I know where his heart is. You see the difference? And a good dad knows. So if I went to my middle kid and said, hey, dude, you're not going to do that again, and, and the consequence for it is I'm taking your phone for a while, he'd be like, oh, dad. And as soon as I walked out of the room, he'd be like, hey, hey, hey. I don't care about that anyway. And if I looked at my other one and said, hey, dude, you can't, you can't go practice anymore, he'd be like, oh, that's terrible, Dad. I walk out of the room, he's like, at least I got my phone. Because they got different, different things going on in their hearts. I'm still trying to figure out my youngest one. I'm still trying to figure out where her heart is. But it's there, and good dads do that. Your Heavenly Father knows where your heart is. He knows what you love. He knows those things in your life that hold a high place in your heart. And he goes for it because God understands that he must have your heart. God does not just want our begrudging behavior modification. He doesn't just want you to follow the rules. He wants your heart because if he has your heart, he'll have all that. Your behavior will follow your heart. You're, you're, we said it last week, your inner life determines your outer life. So God is now going for the jugular, if, if you will, in Abraham's life. He's going for his heart. And he knows his heart is that kid. He knows this thing he loves so much is that kid. And he describes him in a way that tells you God knows you. And he knew Abraham. He says, he's your son. But he's not just your son. He's your only son. He's not just your only son. He's the one you love. There's a unique word being used here. The Hebrew word for only son is Yahid. Everyone say Yahid. It's such a cool word. The guys are going to put it on the screen so you can write it down. It's Hebrew. And then when we translate it over to Greek, it became monogenes. Let's say that beautiful Greek word monogenes. What they both mean is only begotten. It's not just that they're a special kid. It's there's nothing like this kid. This kid is that unique. There's nothing in Abraham's life. Never been one, never will be one again. It's Yahid. It's Monogonez. And, and this is very important for us to understand. And what I want you to see is this points at Jesus. Remember we said every bit of the Bible is pointing us towards Jesus. Because where do you see this phrase being used again? Yahid and Monogonez is used another time in the Bible where God says, I am giving to the world my... Yahid son, my monogonez son, my only begotten son. So God's asking from Abraham something he's going to follow through with later on. Remember I told you, everything in the Old Testament is like a preview for the main event. It's a preview for a movie that's coming. If you know the story we're talking about now, you know what God is asking. He's saying, sacrifice your son. But most of us who grew up in the church understand he's not going to let him do that, is he now? And we'll see how that's going to happen in a minute. But God, a long time later, is going to go all the way through with it. And he's going to say, this is my only begotten. He's Yahid. He is Monogonez. And I will offer him as a sacrifice. Do you see how the Bible points to the gospel? How many of us are thankful for Jesus today on this Father's Day? So... We say this, every journey in the Bible points to Jesus, including this one. God says to Abraham, I want you to take your only son, your Yahid son, your Monogonez son, your only begotten son, and I want you to go and sacrifice him in the mountains where I tell you. So the question would be today, what is your Isaac? What's your Isaac? Answer that question right now. Maybe you have several Isaacs. Things in your life... That you, and there's nothing wrong with having things in your life you love. Just remember, God must be preeminent in our lives, and he moves us that direction. And there is a reason, by the way. It's not just that he is totally self-centered. By the way, he is self-centered, and he's the only being 
in eternity that is absolutely right to be so, okay? He's God, of course. He knows the when 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 you when when you say about someone, he just thinks the world revolves around him. That's always a negative. That's not complimenting someone, right? But with God, it's actually true. It does all revolve around him. So he he can't not be self-centered. Of course, it's all about God, right? But why does he what 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 are the other reasons that God wants to Place the things we love in our lives in their proper place. This is very important because only God can handle the weight of worship. And in Abraham's life, Isaac was pretty close to being worshipped. In Abraham's life, the line between worshipping Isaac and loving Isaac was really thin. And you can understand why, right? Like We can empathize with Abraham. But I bet this is true of every one of us, that we all have things in our lives where the line between you loving this thing or this situation or this person and worshiping them is very, very thin. And what I want you to understand is anything besides God that you worship will disappoint you and you will crush it eventually. Anything you worship besides God, because only God can handle the weight of worship. I remember when I first got into sports, you know, I was playing as a little kid, and then there comes that day where as you grow, you suddenly have to get in the weight room. And that happens at like 13, something like that. And I remember being in the seventh grade, getting in the weight room for the first time, and I'm behind, and I had this friend of mine. You got to watch these kids that look like a barrel walking around, you know. They got these, like even as kids, they're just thick, you know, little short arms. And my little kid, his name was Sam. And, and, and Sam was my good buddy, and he got on the bench, and he pumps out like they threw a bunch of weight on there, and he hits like first time ever, like 135, 140 pounds, and I'm next. So I walk up, and you know, I grew up in Hurley, Mississippi, man. There wasn't a lot of science going on to this, so the coach just looked at me, probably with a little Copenhagen in his mouth, I'm just being honest with you, spat on the ground and said, what can you do? And I said, I can do what he did. Mm-hmm. I got down, I'll never forget. They pulled that bar over my chest. And when that guy let go of it, the next thing I know, it's on my chest. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I didn't even, but it's like, zoom, down, you know? And I, now I'm yelling for, I'm like, Sam, my buddy Sam, help me, Sam, with your little short, stubby arms. Help me. I couldn't handle the weight. Couldn't handle it. Crushed me under, underneath it. Listen, nothing in your life that you place on the throne that only God deserves. Nothing can handle it. You crush it. If you worship your spouse, your spouse is going to eventually let you down since they're not God, and, and you become disappointed in them unfairly, and you crush them eventually. You worship your kids, and we got a lot of family worship that goes on in our area. And I'm glad we love our kids. I'm glad we love them. We should love them, but if you worship your kid, your kid's going to disappoint you. You're going to end up having a bad situation on your hands. Don't worship anything. Don't worship money. Don't worship stuff. Nothing can fill that gap. Genesis 22, 3 through 5 says, so Abraham rose. You see immediate obedience. There is, if you want to learn about Abraham, there is no delay. Abraham rose early the next morning. He didn't hold it off. He saddled his donkey. He took two of his young men with him and Isaac, his son. He split the wood for the burnt offering. You understand, he's doing what God said to do. This is a horrific idea, and he's doing what God said to do. He arose, went to the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes, and he saw the place afar off. And Abraham said to his young men, which would have been servants, He said, stay here with the donkey. The lad and I, lad means young man, not little boy. The lad and I will go yonder and worship. That's how we know he uh, he was actually from Alabama, Abraham. We're going yonder to worship. Anyway, another preacher joke. And we'll come back to you. That last line is important. Look what he says. He does not say, I will come back to you. He says, we will come back to you. Now, two things we see going on here that all of us guys in the room, but all of us people in the room can learn from. Number one, immediate obedience. You say do it, I do it, God. But the next thing we see is that Abraham trusted God completely. How do we know that? Because God looks at those young, uh, Abraham looks at those young men and he says, we're both coming back. I'm supposed to go sacrifice him, but we're both coming back. Now, 
you wonder when you look at that, what is Abraham thinking? Did you know the Bible tells you what he was thinking? This is a really awesome thing about the Bible in this instance. If you go to the New Testament, it tells you what Abraham was thinking and why he said that to those young men. Hebrews eleven seventeen. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, this is this thing we're talking about, offered up Isaac. He went all the way through. And he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son. They say it again, Yahid, Monogonez. Of whom it was said, and Isaac your seed shall be called. So the Bible's telling you, Abraham knew the consequences of this kid dying. It meant the promises would be dead. And since he knew God kept his promises, watch this, verse 19. This is what Abraham was thinking. He had concluded that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from which he also received him in a figurative sense. Abraham got up that morning going, I'm not real sure why God wants me to sacrifice him, but I know that my God keeps his promises So he's just going to raise him from the dead. He had no doubt. He looked at the guys. He said, I don't know why we're doing this. We're both coming back. But here's what I know. God's about to raise him from the dead because he keeps his promises. Folks, that is faith. That's where you go, I don't know how God's going to do it. I just know God's going to do it. I don't know how God's going to be faithful in in, in this culture we're in. I just know he will. I don't know how it's going to work out. I just know it is going to because our God keeps his promises. Amen, church? That was Abraham. He trusted God completely. God has never broken a promise, and he never will. God's never broken a promise, and he never will. And you can believe that today on this Father's Day. Genesis 22, 6 through 7. So Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and he laid it on Isaac, his son. And he took the fire in his hand and a knife and the two of them went together. So Isaac's 15. He's helping him carry all this stuff. Watch this. Verse 7. But Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and he said, My father. He said, Here I am, son. Then he said, Look, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? (laughs) So Isaac's 15. He's not dumb. And he's like, Eh, problem. But there's something else. We always go there. We always go, okay, Isaac's starting to figure things out. But I want you to see something else that's important here on this Father's Day as we learn from this journey. How did Isaac know what worship looked like? Isaac knew there was something missing. Why? How did a 15-year-old know in detail what worshiping the living God looked like? Here's why. Because Abraham modeled worship for his son. And at 15 years old, that boy knew immediately, Dad, something is missing. See, we all look at it going, Isaac figures out. I don't think Isaac knew yet what was going on. I think Isaac, as a 15-year-old, had watched his dad worship the living God so often, so consistently, so perfectly the way God asked him to worship him, that he knew that there had to be a sacrifice, that there is no worship without sacrifice, and he had watched his dad do it for 15 years like clockwork, so he knew when, when they started walking without a lamb, he knew. Hey, Dad, whoa, 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 Dad, Dad. He probably knew his dad was forgetful at this point, too. Hey, dad, 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 we need, hey, we're missing something. And I love that because Abraham had taught his son how to worship. His son knew how to worship. Isaac could have put it all together on his own because he had watched his dad do it for so long. Are we men, are we teaching our kids not just baseball and money and popularity and how to lift a weight and how to shoot a deer or whatever? Are we teaching our kids to worship the living God the way the living God requires us to worship Him? And do our kids know that real worship always involves sacrifice? Do we teach our kids? Do we model it for our kids? Genesis 22, 8 through 10. And Abraham said, my son... God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. So the two of them went together. Then they came to that place which God had told him. And Abraham built an altar there, placed the wood in order. He bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched out his hand, and he took the knife to slay his son. He's going to do it. He's going through with it. And remember what he believes, right? He believes that as soon as he does it, God's just going to raise Isaac from the dead. He is that confident in God. But he's going to do it. And what happens next? Genesis twenty two eleven, 11. But the angel of the Lord, whenever you see the angel of the Lord in capitalized words, that means it's Jesus. 
That's Jesus. Jesus is standing on the mountain with Abraham. The pre-incarnate Son of God calls to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, twice, not just once, twice. So he said, here I am. And he said, do not lay your hand on the ladder. Do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your son, your only son, Monogonez Yahid, from me. Then Abraham lifted his eyes, looked, and there behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. So Abraham went, took the ram, and offered it for a burnt offering instead of his son. Look at that line. Offered it instead of his son. This is foreshadowing the fact because, listen, what you may not know, theologians are almost in universal agreement that this group of little hills where Mount Moriah was, where Abraham went, is the same group of hills where Golgotha is. So they're in the same spot. So in the same place where Abraham lifted the knife, years and years later, that same place, a hammer is going to be lifted with a nail in the other hand, but there will be no stopping it. And God will sacrifice his son in our place. Just like that ram took Isaac's place. One, Listen, that ram on that mountain for Abraham took one person's place one time. It's a foreshadowing. The main event is where the Yahid son of God will be sacrificed one time for all who will believe. Eternally. For all. The ultimate sacrifice. So, substitutionary atonement. Jesus took our place. That's what we believe. Jesus took our place. And what happened after this beautiful moment on the mountain, on this Father's Day? Listen, Genesis twenty two fourteen. Abraham called the name of the place the Lord will provide. And he will provide in that same place years later. As it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. And we are thankful for Jesus today. But today for every dad, every guardian, every man in the room that has a kid, has a son, or has someone that you lead in some way. Can I tell you today, God is faithful And the question is, what is your Isaac? What have you worshipped that God's saying to you today, I want you to lay that down and let me show you that I can provide. That I can provide. A God-designed trip with a God-designed lesson. Now we're going to unpack this, but before we do, let's pray. Jesus, thank you for who you are and what you do in our lives. Thank you for your grace, your goodness, your power. Lord, I pray right now that you would at every room, every campus, online and here, that you would speak to us through your word in a mighty way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So one of the things you get to do after any journey is maybe the least uh, favorite thing that you do on a journey, and that's you get to come home and unpack. Uh, But unpacking is important. So today we want to unpack Uh, what we have learned from this and how to apply this. And so especially on a day like today when we're talking about fathers today. So what can we unpack from this story and how can we begin to apply it to our lives? Three things that I want you to write down. Number one, a good dad loves his kids. A good dad loves his kids. Now you would think that would go, you know, without saying, but I think we need to you know, understand what it means to love our kids. Sometimes we think it's, well, I tell them every day, but, you know, it's not just the words we say, but it's, uh, it's, you know, what do we prioritize in our lives? Are our kids a priority for us? Uh, Or are they just some, you know, someone that's there at the end of the day after I've done what I prioritize, which is work or play or whatever it might be. And, And I can tell you what you prioritize by where you spend your time. And so a good father loves his children, prioritizes, spends time with their kids. And then secondly, uh, a good dad teaches his kids. Teaches kids. There are a lot of things that, that as a dad you can teach your kids. You can, you know, teach your kids how to play sports. You can teach them how to hunt or fish. You can, you know, teach them, uh, you know, things as far as, you know, I used to be able to teach my kids math, but I, I, there's no way I can te- teach my grandkids math. Because uh, math isn't math anymore, so I'm not even sure how they do it. Uh, and so, uh, a lot of things you can teach your kids, 
Uh, but what we need to realize as dads is that everything we do and say is teaching our children something. It's not just walking into a formal setting with our children and saying, okay, kids, today, in this moment of time, this little block of time, I'm going to teach you something. But it's the fact that every word you say teaches them something about the proper way of speaking. Everything you do teaches them something about how to treat their mother, how to treat a woman, how you, to treat their friends. Everything you say teaches them something about what is valuable. Every time you say, hey, I'm too tired to go to church this morning, you just taught your children a lesson about the priority of worship, the priority of church. Every time you say, hey, instead of going to church, let's go do this today, let's go have some fun, you just taught them a great lesson. You taught them a lesson about how church is just a secondary thing. If there's nothing else good to do, then let's go to church. So a good father teaches his children. Then the last thing is that a good father loves God more than he loves his kids. That's almost hard to wrap your mind around, you know, isn't it? That, that I'm really to love God more than my kids. When we think about, we think about the place our children has, have in our hearts. But what we found from Abraham is that, you know, he taught his son what it meant to be a follower of God, what it meant to be a worshiper of God. And there is, Dad, there is no better gift that you can give your children, better than a video game, better than, you know, a gaming system, better than a phone, better than a car. The best thing that you can give your kids is a dad who truly pursues a relationship with God, who makes a relationship with God a priority. I mean, nothing has more impact than for a kid to walk in and see his dad reading God's Word. Nothing has more impact than for a kid to walk in and see his dad on his knees in prayer and to know my dad loves God. My dad pursues God. And in doing so, you're teaching them a lesson that will help them in their relationship with God. So I want to pray for dads today. Abraham is a great example of teaching our children how to follow God, how to worship God. But all through Scripture, there are examples. And all through Scripture, there is teaching about what it means to be a godly man. In being a godly man, then we become godly fathers. So I just want to take a moment to pray for you, that you would uh, seek out those truths and you would apply those truths to your life. So would you bow your head with me? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you today for all the men in this room and in God, uh, in whichever way they became a father. God, whether it be biologically or as a stepdad or as a foster dad or an adoptive dad or as we said earlier, maybe, maybe they've just given their lives to pour into young people uh, by being a small group leader, a mentor to, to all of them. We are thankful for them today. And God, I, I just, I, I pray that you would instill these truths today to awaken something in them to help them to realize that the most important thing that they can do for their children is not to make a lot of money and not to be successful and not to buy a lot of things. But the most important thing that they can do is to love you and to have a growing relationship with you. A relationship with you that they're not ashamed to talk to their children about and to encourage them into that same relationship. So God, I pray that you would uh, just lead them wherever they are in their relationship with you right now, that you would begin to speak to their heart and speak into their lives and help them to see the changes that they may need to make to be the best dad that they can be. But God, also today, we, we are mindful of the fact that a day like today is a difficult day for a lot of people. Because maybe that uh, this may be the first Father's Day that their father hasn't been with them. 
or maybe this is just one of many Father's Day that bring back a lot of painful memories because their dad, their earthly dad, just didn't live up to what a good dad should be. And God, we just pray for them that you would comfort them and and encourage them today and just remind them of a truth that that sometimes just sounds like a spiritual cliche, but God, it's not. It is truth, and that is that you are their heavenly Father, and you love them, and you are with them. And I pray, God, that you would strengthen them today. And God, then I, I know that there are men who would love to be able to be called dad. But for whatever reason, that just hasn't happened. And they long to be a dad. And there are some that maybe, maybe they have been a dad, but because of loss, they don't have their child with them anymore. And so God, we're mindful of them and we pray for them that you would encourage, strengthen them, give them guidance and direction in their lives. And again, just love them with a very special love today. Again, God, I thank you for all the men in this room. Pray, God, that you would help them to be the examples that are so desperately needed by the young people that are around them. God, use them for your glory and for your honor. In Jesus' name, amen.